So what is a professor of physics doing, suspended in mid-air like this, coming into the Royal Institution from the roof? Well, you may well ask. It's to make a serious scientific point. There's 10,000 billion billion tons of the Earth down there, pulling me down by its gravity. And this slender rope above me is resisting it. The electromagnetic forces in this rope are counterbalancing the pull of the entire Earth. Now, let's release myself. Oh, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> now, this is a live show, and if I don't get this off in the next hour, the next program gets delayed, and uh, Bryson will show me how, I'm sure. Gravity is sort of a thing you take for granted, and that's why we decided we had to make it look a bit different this time. And uh, different it certainly is dramatic stuff. Now, it's really safety conscious, this, so I've got these things to take off. Thanks very much. I think that's where I stop. <laughs> so, gravity, the force that's most familiar to us. It makes people fall to the ground, thankfully rather slowly on that occasion, and it acts across the whole universe. In fact, I brought the solar system here to the theatre to show you. This beautiful thing here is called an orrery. It's invaluable. I'm treating it very, very carefully. Can you see the moon going around the Earth and the Earth and the planets going around the sun? Here's the sun in the middle. The Earth, not the scale, by the way, and the moon going around it. And the outer planets here with their own moons. So this is gravity acting across the solar system, right the way across space, making everything orbit around the sun. Now, the sun itself is orbiting around the galaxy, and the galaxies are also orbiting around the universe. Gravity is ruling this whole huge show that you see here. And that's gravity in the big scale. But you can take very careful measurements of exactly where the different planets are night to night, month, year by year. And what they found 100, 200 years ago, was that things didn't seem quite to be going right on the very edges of the solar system. All they knew in those days was as far as Uranus. And they found that they seemed to be wobbling very slightly compared with what they ought to be. They really understood gravity. Something was missing. And from that, they deduced that there were further planets beyond Uranus, and now we know of Neptune and Pluto. So that's an example of gravity really being understood and being used to deduce that something you haven't seen is out there. Now, the same thing is happening today. We have whole galaxies in motion, gravity pulling on them just like the planets are down here. And we find that the galaxies don't seem to be quite moving as you expect them to. There's some dark matter out there, huge tracks of the stuff pulling gravitationally on the stars and the galaxies, which we have not yet seen, but we have begun to be aware of them because of the knowledge we have of gravity. So, that's gravity, the most familiar force right the way across the universe. The electromagnetic force, the very powerful thing that stopped me falling straight to the Earth, that is what's going on inside us at this moment. Everything that's solid, the shapes of everything, the planets, you and me, everything around us here, those solid shapes are the result of the electromagnetic forces inside us, gripping all the atoms together very tightly, resisting gravity. So, gravity and the electromagnetic force, those two major forces with us right now. 
It's the electromagnetic force that makes the floor solid, so that we don't just carry on straight down to the centre of the Earth. There's something gets in the way. And that is really what we're doing today. We're going on the trail of the forces. We're going right back in the very first moments, to the moments even before the primeval quarks were made. We're going back to within a billionth of a second of the Big Bang, just before matter began. And this was the period when the forces ruled. And it's on the trail of the forces today. We're peeling off the very last layer of the cosmic onion. We've come down through atoms to the nucleus, to the protons and to the quarks. And we're peeling off that last layer today to see where the quarks came from. How were they created, the primeval seeds of all matter? Now you can see from this that we're getting very near to really deep questions about our origins, about how did things begin? What drives it all? Where do we all come from? Now we're not the first people to ask this question. In fact, every culture throughout history has asked this question one way or another. And it goes back throughout all literature. Let's go and look at an example here. This beautiful picture shows the Hindu's idea of creation. According to them, there was this milk everywhere, the unformed universe. And here you see some of the gods churning the milk, the forces at work, forcing the milk around, turning it into the structured universe we have today. They didn't tell us where the milk came from. That's sort of put in at the start. And what we've got over here, this is a Dogen door from West Africa. A beautiful door that you find on the front of the granaries out there. This tells their own myths of creation and history. On the front, you see all these figures. This is actually a genealogy of the people. They've got their own history right the way back to what they believe the start of time to be on the front of their granary doors. Now, according to them, the original granary was brought to earth by a blacksmith who came down from heaven. He slid down on a rainbow and brought the grain with him and everything that you need, like fire and iron, all the ingredients needed to make the day-to-day -day universe. But where the rainbow came from isn't said. And the one that's most familiar to us, perhaps, is the biblical tradition, the Old Testament. It says, there was darkness on the face of the void, and then let there be light, and there was light. Compare that with what we have today, the sort of perception of the Big Bang. If I was asked to summarize the Big Bang in just two sentences, we would say, once upon a time, there was no time. You know, that's before the Big Bang. And then the Big Bang happened, and time began. Now, that's a two-sentence summary of the present perception of the universe by 20th century science. It's not that different from there was darkness on the face of the void. Once upon a time, there was no time. And let there be light, and there was light. The Big Bang happened, and the universe began. So there's great similarities there, but there's also differences. The crucial differences are that by experiment, we can go back to within a billionth of a second of when that light turned on, when the Big Bang happened. I don't know what happened before it, but from that moment onwards, we can, by experiment and looking, recreate the progress of the universe from that first moment up to now. And that's the journey that we've been taking right down to that first moment. But it is, in my opinion, quite important here to recognize how near we are to the boundaries of science, between science and myth or philosophy. And Peter Medawar put it very nicely. He said, there are some questions that are beyond science to answer, such as, what's the meaning of life? I mean, that's the sort of question that science is supposed to be able to answer. Or, what happened before the start of time? And he said, only charlatans will profess to answer those questions, so I shall not. I shall stick that to my definition of what we can discuss and what we can't discuss. So I don't know how that Big Bang happened. I don't know how that light turned on, but once it was there, we can progress and work out how the matter was created and brought through to the universe we now see. And that's what we're doing today, that final layer of the cosmic onion, how the light turned into the matter that we're created from. <laughs>